We begin today, Shir, 15 lines from the top of Daf Ayin Tes. In our last Shir, we introduced the Nisinim, those people upon whom there was a Gzera, a ruling, that they shall not be accepted in terms of marriage into the rank and file of Jewish people. People of pure Jewish descent cannot marry the Nisinim. This type of prohibition, though in, uh, on a different level, you find by a mamzer. We mentioned in the, at the end of our previous year why David had made a gzera against them. He felt that their uh, character was something that could not possibly cling unto the Jewish people. They, these are people that had an, uh, a strain of cruelty to them and we saw that in their demand for vengeance through the taking of the lives of seven of King Shaul's, King Saul's descendants and uh, we are picking up with that uh, point that in fact David HaMelech is his hands are tied so to speak he attempted to he attempted to appease them uh, after having discovered that their uh, their gripe was in fact the reason for a three year famine and after attempting to appease them after they pointed out that they wanted this vengeance uh, after attempting to do so he failed and they remained intransigent in their demand so we have the uh, we saw, as, as we said before, a reference to seven descendants of Shoal HaMelech that they wanted to see killed. Um, we pick up our Gemara with a posuk, Vayika HaMelech es shnei b'nei ritzbo basayo, asher yodol l'shol, es harmoni ves mefiboshes, ves chameshes b'nei michal bas shol, asher yodol l'adriel ben barzilai hamecholosi. So in this posuk we see that Dovid HaMelech he takes two of the sons of Ritzba that gave birth uh, to to whom she gave birth through her husband Shaul, and five uh, d- uh, children of Michal Bas Shaul. So these will be five grandchildren of Shaul. The Gemara asks, "My Shnohani, what's unique about these? After all, they were other descendants of Shaul, so." How is it that these were chosen? Omar Rav Huna, chosen of course to be executed, uh, to uh, appease the vengeance of the uh, Givonim, the Nesinim. The Givonim and Nesinim are one and the same for our discussion. Omar Rav Huna. Rav Huna tells us, Hevirum Lifne Aroin. There was a, a, a parade, if you will, of the descendants of Shoal that marched in front of the Oron, the Holy Ark. Kol she'oron koltoi lemisa. Anyone that miraculously was... Uh, Kolto is... Uh, was, we'll say in our context means it was, was stopped by the Oron. In other words, there was some type of miracle that took place that when they passed in front of the Oron. These individuals couldn't keep walking. They were, they were trapped or caught by the Oron. So that's a sign that they are to be executed. Kol she'en Oron kolto. Any of those that were able to walk by the Oron without being restrained. L'chaim. They would live. Mosiv Rav Chona Bar Katina. The Pasuk says, Vayachmuel HaMelech al Mephiboshes ben Yehoinoson ben Shaul. The uh, name Mephiboshes is dashed underlined, and you can see a few lines above, we also had dashed underlined his name. And this Pasuk says that Dovid had compassion on Mephiboshes, the son of Yehoinoson, who was in fact the son of Shoal, so that Mephibosheth should be a grandson of Shoal. Rashi explains, Vayachmoel HaMelech, we're looking at Rashi together at the upper part of the narrow lines, V'i Ba'oron Talio Milsa, if it was dependent on the Oron, Kevon Delo Kalto Oron, since the Oron didn't uh, restrain him, Mahu Chemlosa Shal what's the significance of Dovid HaMelech's compassion 
And the Gemara answers, Umishani Shelo Heviro, as we see now in the Gemara text, Shelo Heviro. What was the compassion of David? Well, it means that he didn't put him in the position to be in, to be restrained by the Aron in the first place. He didn't have him, Shelo Heviro didn't have him pass by the Aron from the outset. Question, Vachi Masu Ponim Yesh Badavar is 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 David to show favoritism uh, in uh, to, to show partiality in matters of uh, capital cases he we're dealing here with a situation where people are going to be executed how can you choose one over the other Ella rather the Gemara continues Sheheviroi Vakoltoi the Mifiboshes was passed by the Oron, and in fact, he was restrained. So that's a simon, that's a sign that he is to die. And David prayed, and as a result of the prayer, he was released. Question. But still, since the Oron had. Uh, restrained him uh, and, and disabled him from continuing to walk past it so it, it's not right that someone else should be killed in his place the Gemara continues Elo shelo yiklutenu David's uh, expression of compassion was through prayer that he should he should not be restrained by the Oron so that we wouldn't get the impression that he was was restrained and then released and someone else put in his place, but rather through the prayer of David he was able to walk by freely. Question Vahok Siv, is there not a posit that says Lo Yumsu Avois Al Bonim? There's a note on the side that says that the Ikr Kavona in quoting this posik is from the end of the posik where it goes on to say Ish Bechetoi Yumsu, a person shall die only because of his own sins. And as you will recall in our previous year, the whole matter involving the Givoinim was that Shaul had seen to the execution of Noi Virakihanim. They provided uh, sustenance, so say livelihood for these Givoinim people, and with the death with the killing of the uh, Kohanim of Noiv, so they lost their livelihood. And that was recounted by the Pesach as if Shaul had killed them, the Givonim themselves. And they, the, so the, the sin, so to speak, of the, of the uh, uh, setback of the Givonim, that was a result of Shaul's decisions, Shoal's behavior. Why should his descendants pay a price for their predecessors' wrongdoing? Omar Rabbi Chia Bar Abba Om Rabbi Yochanan. So here we have a very dramatic response to that very significant question. The response is Mutov Sheteokir Oisachas Minatora. Better that one letter should be uprooted from the Torah. In other words, there, the Pesach did present a principle to us. However, we have a counter-consideration, and that is that if nothing is done, and the Givonim uh, gripe remains untended to, that would result in what we call a Chilul Shem Shemayim. So we're saying it's better for, in, in, in this case, it's a, uh, we'll get a one-time... Uh, contingency ruling to uh, abrogate the uh, teaching of the Pasuk that people should do not pay for predecessor sins and here they will as long as we're able to prevent the name of the Almighty from being desecrated in public what's the what's the desecration issue so let's take a look at Rashi if nothing is done for the vengeance on behalf of the Givainim, nations of the world will say, 
The Jewish people are not fit to cleaving unto, to sticking with, to joining up with. Look at these Jews. They afflicted these converts, the Givoinim Nesinim converts, and they robbed them of their livelihood. And no vengeance was taken on their behalf. So what we're concerned with here is what the the impression that will be created by lack of action on the part of the Jews will give rise to uh, uh, sinister remarks concerning the Jewish people resulting in others not wanting to join up with the Jewish people. So in order to uh, rectify that or prevent that from having from uh, from ar- uh, arising, we're going to, uh, as we say, abrogate the, a teaching of the Torah in order to preserve, we'll say, this greater consideration. We continue in the Gemara. Fatika chutzpah basayo es asat. This is, of course, the posuk, the the, la- the woman with whom we open the posuk, the mother of. Um, Two of the victims. So she took uh, sackcloth. Vatateu lo el hatsur mitchilas kotsir ad nosach ad nosach mayim aleim in hashemayim. What she did is she took some sackcloth and she covered the bodies of her of the executed ones from the harvest season until the rainy season. This the, this the period of time covers all of the summer months. She was she was very diligent in protecting the bodies, not allowing birds of, 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 of during the day nor animals at night of um, wreaking havoc on the bodies. So what do we see? We have a situation where. Uh, First of all, you see they were not given to burial for a few months. And you also see uh, her diligence in protecting the bodies. The Gemara asks on the second wide line, The Torah specifically warns that a person who is executed, the body is not to remain overnight on the uh, ex- on the uh, pole on which bodies were suspended after being executed, after being stoned. We see then that executed vi- execution victims or uh, perpetrators that were executed, uh, even though they were their offenders, we have an obligation to bury their bodies before nightfall. All the more so over here, they're, they're, how could their bodies have been left uh, strung up in, in public view for months? Omar Rabbi Yochanan, Mishum Rabbi Shimon ben Yehitzadak. And again, we have very similar consideration to what we had before. Mutav sheteokio yisachas minatero. Better that one letter, or here in this case, a rule, should be uprooted from the Torah. Again, a momentary, a one-time ruling. Fiskadi shame shemayim frasya. And through leaving the bodies exposed for uh, this elongated period of time, we will achieve sanctification of God's name what do we mean by the sanctification of his name passers by when seeing uh, bodies suspended in full view people will say are passers by they'll say what are, who are these people what's the nature of these people and they'll be told these are descendants of kings these are princes Uma <laughs> Osu, what did they do to be strung up like that? Answer: Poshtu Yedeim Begeim Gurim. They or their predecessor had had afflicted uh, questionable converts. Gurim Gurim are people that are that drag literally drag along, but they're the the Nesinim we mentioned uh, we touched on their history in our previous Shurim that they were a, a fair, they were actually a lowly people. They came. In, through trickery, claiming they were they were those they were someone else other than who they really were. They were were really dis, uh, members of the seven nations that the Jewish people were expected to annihilate anyway. 
So they had misrepresented themselves and uh, joined the Jewish people through questionable means, we'll say. Hence, they're called Gerim Grurim. So passers-by will say, the people strung up are princes that had, uh, had been afflicted by their predecessors uh, and, and, and lost their livelihood. Uh, Omru, people will then say, Ein l'cha uma shiruya lidabek ba'kizu. There is no nation like this nation, like the Jewish people. Uma b'nei malachim kach. Mind you, look at the fate of even princes. B'nei hediotis alachas kama v'kama. Commoners, all the more so. If, if uh, princes can pay are, will end up paying the price as the, the common saying goes no one is above the law so even if the highest class pay the price you can imagine how how prominent the law will be when it comes to commoners and mind you at the other extreme how even these lowly individuals benefited from what we'll call the legal defense or the legal system from the concern of the Jewish leadership Yisrael Achaz Kama Vakama someone who becomes Jewish a regular Jew a, a legitimate convert all the more so will be cared for by the uh, rule of law by the public concern by the in, in, in interest in being Mekadi Shem Shemayim so that passers by will come and say wow this Jewish people is an, are an amazing people how concerned they are for the for the uh, the uh, oppressed, how concerned they are for Kiddush Hashem. <laughs> what a, what a what a good deal, so to speak, in joining up with the Jewish people. Miyad, and, and at that point, Nisvasva Yisrael Meav Chamishim one hundred fifty thousand people joined up, converted to Judaism. Shenemar Vayilu Shlomo Shivim Elif No, you say Sabal Shivim Elif Chosev Bahar. And it says that at that point in time, King Solomon, Shlomo HaMelech, had 70,000 uh, load bearers and 80,000 uh, stone uh, ewers. The Gemara asks, the Dilmum Yisrael Havu, maybe the Pesach is describing Jews, uh, original Jews, not uh, converts, people joining up. Lo No, you can't suggest that. Israel, Lo Nosan Shlomo Eved. As far as the Jewish people are concerned, they did not serve in any servile capacity. The Dilma Dugzar maybe the reference to these hundred and fifty thousand people are they're hired hands. They're not people that are that are joining as joining as slaves to the Jewish people. So how do you see that that uh, pe- people joined the ranks of the Jews as a result of the execution of the descendants of Shol? Elamei Hacha, Vayispor Shlomo. By the way, Shlomo was the son of King David. David is the one who saw to it that the Givoni would receive their desired revenge. So we have another pasuk. Vayispor Shlomo Kol Hanoshim Agir Mashiach Beretz Yisrael. So we see in this Pasuk that the uh, people that had joined up were Gerim. They were people that converted to the Jewish people. Not hired hands, not original Jews. The Gemara now asks, and we have a little uh, structural note on the side because we're going to be introduced to a new marking a diamond and on the side we have indicated these are Gimel three people Shegozru al Hanasinim that had made rulings concerning the restriction of marrying Nasinim so the Gemara asks Unasinim David Gozar Alem is that true that David is the one that made the Xera Concerning the Nasinim, that's what we've been claiming till now at least. Is that true though? Moshe goes our land. We find that Moshe Rabbeinu made a against the Nasinim. That they are to be placed as as slaves. 
Chotei uh, are are uh, woodsmen and Shoev Mecha water bearers. So why is it that their uh, distancing is associated with David when we see that that Moshe Rabbeinu did not accept them as converts but rather declared that they shall remain as slaves? The Gemara answers... Moshe Gozar Lahu Dora. Moshe made a Xera concerning the Nasinim of his generation. David Gozar Lukule Dora. David imposed a Xera for future generations as well. Question Vakati Yoshua Gozar Alayo. But still, we have another personage that made a Xera before David Hamelech, namely Yoshua. Dichti, Vait name Yoshua Bayomahu, Chaifei Eitzim, Vishua Vimayim, Lo Eida. Hashem. So we see that Yeshua had declared that they shall be uh, sto- uh, uh, cr- um, woodsmen and water bearers. Yeshua Gozar Bizman Yeshua did make a ruling concerning the Givonim or the Nasinim as long as the Beis Hamikdash was extant. David Gozar Bizman Shein Beis Hamikdash Kaim. David extended the Xera to a time beyond the Beis Hamikdash. You can see in the Pesach where Yoshua was Beis Hamikdash oriented because at the end of the Pesach we had cited just the line above this. It said at the end of the Pesach Ule Mizbach Hashem. They were relegated to being crafts, uh, woodsmen and water drawers, drawers for the benefit of the Beis Hamikdash. But David uh, came and extended the Xera beyond. The Gemara continues at the top of Omid Beis, Bimei Rebbe, Bikshu Lahatir Nesinim. In the uh, time of Rebbe, there was thought to uh, declare the Nesinim Mutter. In other words, to remove their slave status. Omar Lohem Rebbe. So as we said, this was in the days of Rebbe. It wasn't Rebbe himself. Rebbe reacted and said, Chelkenu Natir, the holding that we have in them as slaves, the, that aspect of their slavery that serves us, that we can undo. Chelik Mizbeach Miyatir, however, the portion held in them, in other words, their in, in, in indebtedness of slavery to the base Hamikdash, who can undo that? In other words, something that you own, you can declare unowned. But something that you don't own, something you don't have a holding in, for example, in these Givoinim, Nisinim, part of their uh, obligatory service was to the base Hamikdash. Who can, who can relinquish that? Upligo derbichia bar Abba. The statement we just saw by, made by Rebbe that said, the chilek of the Mizbech, who can mat you that? That is at odds with Rabbi Chia's teaching. The Omar Rabbi Chia bar Abba. Omar Rabbi Yochanan, chilek aida li'oilam asr. The chilek of the people, the aidas, the, com- the community, that remains asr. You can't release that. Uh, uh, you, it can't be freed up unless they formally release it. Until they're matir, until they're mafkir, they're holding. Chelek Mizbeach, the aspect of the Givoinim that was indebted to the Mizbeach as well, that Mizman Shabbat Shemidish Kaim Osir, when the Beis Hamidish is around, so that cannot be relinquished. That they, they have a debt of servitude to the Beis Hamidish. However, Ain Beis Hamidish Kaim Shari, and this is dashed underline because this is the main point. When the Beis Hamidish is not around, so that. Uh, uh, servitude is automatically released. So just to go over this machlokas, according to Rebbe, the servitude toward the base amigdash is forever binding. Even if there's no base amigdash, that obligation of slavery remains. So they can never be freed up. They can, but according to Rebbe Bar Abba, uh, when the base amigdash is not not around anymore, so they have no servitude to that and. They could, it seems from the context of this Gemara, that they could actually be freed up and a uh, slave that's freed essentially becomes a full-fledged Jew. Becomes a Ben-Churin, as the Halacha refers to him. 
the Mishnah. Before we begin the Mishnah, we should note on the side the Nosei Mivneh heading, the topic heading with structural note. You'll see that in the diamonds there appears the names of Rabbi Kiva and Rabbi Lazar. Their Cholkim, they argue Al Ezes Soris, Chama O Adam Cholates. A Soris is a man that uh, is basically incapable of procreation. He he doesn't develop and mature in a normal, proper, uh, healthy fashion. He's a Soris, and uh, there's a reference in Rashi that. It indicates that the Saurus is in the it falls under the category of a Kushavcha. Kushavcha, we discussed in previous in recent Dapim, is someone that's incapable of procreation and is not allowed to marry into the Jewish people. When we discuss this phenomenon of Saurus, there are two kinds of Saurus that will be referenced. One is called a Sris Chama literally a stress of the of the sun s u n but it's really a reference to a person who was born like that not as a result of some kind of ailment then there is that's that's what we call an stress comma he's born like that a, there's another term stress odam that we'll see rashi says that means he became a sorus he became this way after he was born. In other words, he was born normal and then something happened. The Mishnah. Omar Rabbi Yoshua. Shomati shehasoris choyletz v'cholzen li'ishto. I heard that the soris is someone that if he is a surviving brother in the case of the passing, the death of a brother leaving no children, so he is the Yavam. If uh, he is the only brother, so he will do chalitza. And if he dies, obviously leaving no children, he's a soris. So cholzin lishto, his uh, wife will participate in chalitza. On the other hand, the hasoris lo cholitz v'lo cholzin lishto. And I also heard that the opposite, that a soris does not do chalitza, and his wife, the widow, does not participate in Chalitza. We should take a uh, look at Rashi. Vasoris lo cholets, dichtiv, the Posik says, lo yimoches shemoi mi Yisrael. This is a reference to a person who dies leaving no children, and the Torah expects a surviving brother to do yibum, to marry the widow, in order so that, so that the name of the deceased is preserved, is not erased. So now, this posuk of lo yimoches shmo yisrael prat nesoros. This excludes the source shishmo mochli. He's incapable of procreation, as we said just before that he is a type of kruz shavcha, a type of uh, psuadaka, that someone who is incapable of procreation. So Rabbi Yeshua hears two things, two contradictory points, and. He uh, the ain li lefari she says in the Mishnah and I don't know how to explain this. Omar Rabbi Akiva ani afarish, and we have the diamond uh, as we saw before in our introduction. We mentioned these are uh, uh, Rabbi Akiva versus Rabbi Elazar. Two opinions as to which Soros is being referred to in Rabbi Yeshua's remark. So he says I'll explain Soros Adam cholates. The Cholzelishto. You see, we the double underline uh, is used to highlight uh, each one of these. So they, according to Rabbi Akiva, the Soris Odom. This is a person who became a Soris after he was born. So he does Chalitza and Cholzelishto if he dies. Uh, leaving no children, so his wife will be eligible to participate in Chalitza. Because he had been healthy. Kosher means uh, ab- uh, able, ability. He, had, he, had, he was qualified in procreation. There was a time that he could have but procreated, but something happened to him that now made him a Soros. So the fact that he once was capable of procreation, he is subject to the laws of Chalitza. Soris Chamo, this is someone who was born that way, 
He doesn't do chalitza, nor will his wife participate in chalitza, because he was never qualified. Rabbi Lezer Omer Loki. Rabbi Lezer says the opposite. He says, not so. Elo, Sris Chamo Chaylets Vechotzen Lishto. A Sris Chamo is subject to the laws of Chalitza. Mitnei Sheyesh Loi Refua. Because a Sris Chamo is someone that can be healed. Sris Odom Loi Chaylets Vechotzen Lishto. Mitnei Sheyem Loi Refua. And this is, of course, in contrast to the Sris Odom that has no solution, no healing Hayid Rabbi Yeshua ben Becerra al ben Megusis Shehoya b'Yerushalayim. There was a person referred to as ben Megusis that was Yerushalayim. Sris Adam. He was that kind of person. A Sris Adam. Ve'yibmu as Ishto. He died, leaving no children, and his wife was married by a surviving brother. Lekayim divrei Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva is the one that said that Sris Adam is subject to the laws of Chalitza, the laws of Yibum. So that you see Rabbi Yeshua ben Becerra's testimony supports the opinion, the, uh, the uh, position of Rabbi Akiva. Hasoris lo cholets velo The The Soris is not to participate in Chalitza nor Yibum. V'chein Ailunis lo cholets velo misyabemis. And Ailunis we can say as the female counterpart of the Soros, she is a woman that did not develop normally, and she is hence incapable of procreation. So she does not do chalitza nor yibum. Hasoris she cholatz liyavimto lo posla. A Soros that does chalitza to a widow of a brother of his that died, leaving no children. So Lo Posla doesn't render her or doesn't disqualify her as a widow from eventually marrying a Kohen. A real Chalutza is disqualified from the Kuna. But since the Soros is excluded from the realm of Ibum, his chalitza is meaningless. So he does not dis- his chalitza does not disqualify her from the kuna. Bo'ala posla. If the Soros, instead of doing chalitza, he has inter- uh, intimacy with her that will disqualify her from the kuna. Why? It's a forbidden form of intimacy. Why is that? Well, he is a brother-in-law. She, to him, is the wife of his brother. A wife of an Aishis Ochiv, if it's not in the context of mitzvah, so that's a totally forbidden relationship. Now what do we mean by the context of mitzvah? Where the mitzvah of Yibum can be performed, but the Saurus is disqualified from the mitzvah of Yibum. Hence his intimacy with her is purely sinful. And a sinful intimacy results in her being disqualified from the kahuna. V'chein Ailinus. Likewise with the Ailinus. Shecholtsu lo achin. If she uh, is a widow, having have had had no children, and one of the brothers does chalitza with her, that does not make her into a chalitza. She is hence not she's not considered then disqualified from the kahuna. up if one of the surviving brothers had intimacy with her poslua. they render her disqualified unfit to marrying a Kohen they should be because that is a forbidden form of intimacy it's a brother-in-law cohabiting uh, with his sister-in-law outside the parameters of the mitzvah the Gemara Michti Shaminon le Rabbi Akiva de Omar Chayve Lavin Kechayve Krisis Domu. We know that Rabbi Akiva 
halachically, with ha- the halachic ramifications of intimacy with a chayve lavin, with someone who is prohibited on the grounds of being a violation of a negative command, is the same, has the same halachic outcome as someone who has intimacy with whom they would be punishable by kores. What's an example of chayve lavin? So let's bring things right home to our sukya. A saris odom. According to Rabbi Akiva, uh, let, uh, let, us, uh, let us back up for a moment. A saris odom is a person that right now is incapable of procreation. And how therefore can Rabbi Akiva say that a Sri Sodom, which by the way Rashi, it's at this point we made references earlier, but the Sri Sodom is considered an Isur Lav, the Lav of Lo Yovo Ptsua Daka. He is, is a, he is a, uh, an example of a Ptsua Daka, carrying therefore a, a penalty of a, of a negative violation. It's considered a negative command. Lo Yovo means a Ptsua Daka shall not marry into the Jewish fold. How then can Rabbi Akiva say that a Sris, Adam, does Chalitza with his brother's wife? It's a relationship that's strictly forbidden. Just like Chiv Krisus, for example. The example we've been using since the beginning of the Mesechta. If uh, Ruvain married Shimon's daughter. Ruvain and Shimon are brothers. Ruvain marries his niece. Ruvain dies leaving no children. The father, Shimon, is not going to do chalitza and certainly not Yibum with his daughter. Rabbi Akiva views the realm of Chive Lavim, Chive Lavim like Chive Krisis, like any severe form of forbidden relations. And the Gemara goes on to say, V'chayve krisus lav b'nei chalitza v'yibol ninu, as we just illustrated. Chayve krisus uh, are not subject to the laws of chalitza and yibol. There's total exemption. How, therefore, can Rabbi Kiva say that a sris adam, who is a negative command, a Jew is not to marry a sris adam, how, therefore, can he say chalitza is done? This is essentially the title of our sugya, And this we wrote on the side, no need to read it again. On the side we also have a mivne, a structural note, where we feature the triangle, because as you go ahead, as you go through the sukya, you'll notice triangles appearing. These represent shuvo islana, these are answers to this particular question. How can Rebbe Kiva, when on the one hand we know that a sris odom is an example of a Chiv Lav, an Isur Lav, a prohibition to the tune of a negative command, Lo Yavo Ptsuadaka, the Torah says. And Rabbi Kiva is very strict with his outlook toward Chiyuve Lavin. He views them like Chiyuve Kores. How then can Rabbi Akiva say in the Mishnah that is Sri Sadam Chaylis Vachaisim Lishtai? The Gemara continues with the first triangle, Om Rabbi Ami, Hacha Bemai Askinon. The Mishnah that speaks about the Soros doing Chalitza, Kegain Shenosa Ochiv Giores. The brother that now dies, he had married, his wife was a Giores. And now you have a Giores, a convert. The woman was a convert to Judaism. Her husband died, leaving her as a widow. So the widow is Zekuka Liebum. She's now bound to the surviving brothers. And we're talking now about a brother who is a Soris. Rabbi Kiva Sovar Lok Rabbi Rabbi Kiva accepts Rabbi Yossi's outlook that says, Yomar Kehal Geirim Lo Ikri Kahal. The community of Geirim, of converts, is not classified in halachic terms as a kahal, as a community. In, our, in previous shurim we say with these, some of these words, there are certain words that you see in learning that the translation simply diminishes from the, from the impact. The, it's really a halachic concept, the word kahal. 
and and in this in in this sense, the uh, pasuk has to be borne in mind, where the pasuk says that these they're not to enter a kahal however the marriage between a saris, Adam and a giores is not considered uh, a kahal marriage so that the saris is not in violation of marrying her she's not part of kahal and all the posik had done had said was warned against Marrying into Kahal. The Gemara asks, Will Ihachi Yavumi Nami Miyabe? If that be the case, so why in the Mishnah does Rabbi Kiva speak about the Sri Sodom doing Chalitza? Why doesn't he mention Yibum also? In Hachinami, in fact, that is the case. Yibum could have been done. The Aidi, the Omar, Rabbi Yeshua Chalitz, since Rabbi Yeshua used the term Chalitz, Omar Ihu Nami Cholets. Rabbi Kiva also used that term. After all, Rabbi Kiva was addressing Rabbi Yoshua. Daiko Nami Dekotoni. And further proof to this by careful reading of the mission, you can see that Rabbi Kiva uh, approves of Yibum as well. It said in our Mishnah, Hayid Rabbi Yoshua ben Becerra, al ben Megusis. A, and we saw this in our mission that Rabbi Yeshua ben Becerra testified about a, an indi- individual referred to as Ben Megusis, Shahaya Biushalayim, Sris Adam Vihibumu Es Ishto, Lekayim Divre Rabbi Kiva. And what we've done with our markings, we emphasize the main points, especially the word Vihibumu. We squiggle underline that, giving that a, a, strong, a strong emphasis that here you have an act of Yibum done between. The, a woman and the Sris Adam uh, substantiating Rabbi Akiva's approach that Yibum is also an option Shema Mino so this is, a, this is conclusive that Rabbi Akiva would have approved Yibum as well and following Rabbi Ami's explanation because we were, the Mishnah is talking about a case of a Sris Adam doing Yibum with Yibum or Chalitza with a Giyores Mosiv Rabba uh, Rabba um, introduces a Tanaic source which is going to uh, present a problem for us. Um, the easiest thing for us to do is essentially go through the source and then uh, highlight the problem. The source says, Psuadaka Ukus Shavcha, Sris Adam Behazokain. There are different people mentioned in this source, amongst whom you see. A Sris Adam is mentioned, and, uh, it, and in the source it says Cholates, Cholsin O Miyabmin. So here you have a source that reflects an approach that Rabbi Kiva would take that a Sris Adam is participatory in Chalitza, Ketzad. And we have here, Ketzad means uh, how can we illustrate this? And we have two. Uh, Let's see two approaches, two sides of the same coin, if, and they're highlighted with our numbers Roman numerals one and two. Mesu v'lahem nashim. The first illustration involves uh, their dying, so we're going to focus only on the Sris Adam, not the other cases. A Sris Adam dies, and they have a uh, wife, a widow. V'lahem achim, and there is a brother. The Omdu Achin, the Osu Maimer bin Shoseim, and the surviving brothers, one of them did. Uh, Maimer, that's offering money to the Yavama, the Nosnu Get, or gave her a document of divorce, O Shecholsu, or they did Chalitza. Again, we're dealing with the widow of a Soris Adam, Ma Sheosu Osu, the Imbalu Kono. If they did, whatever they did takes hold, and if they did bia, if they did actual yibum with her, so it it takes hold. Mesu achin v'yomdu hein. Here is the opposite situation where a, a healthy brother died, 
and the Sris Adam gets up. Sris Adam, as we said before, in addition to any of these other cases, but we're focusing only on the Sris Adam. Uh, we're not dealing, we're not, in our explanation, we're not focusing on the Zokain or Tsuadaku Kushachu, but a Sri Sodom gets up, Amduhain, the Osu Maimer Binishosam, the Nosnu Ged, Oishikhalsu. If they did uh, Maimer, they gave money, you're here talking the Sri Sodom gives money, or he gives her a divorce document, or does Chalitza, Masha Osu Osu. Whatever they do, that would take hold with their different halachic ramifications we've discussed Maimer and Get uh, very very extensively earlier in the Mesichta however what we want to start focusing on is here the Imbalu Kanu if they did be also it acquires it takes hold the Osir Lekaimon but it's also to ma- maintain that marriage Mishum Shinemar Lo Yovoi Ptsua Daka Ukushavcha Bekahal Hashem. So we see Alma, the Gemara says, we see from here Bekahal Askinon. Before, we, Rabbi Ami had explained that Rabbi Kiva's acceptance of a Swiss Odom doing Chalitza and Yibum is because we're dealing with a non Kahal situation. If it was a kahal, and, and how did we achieve that non-kahal situation? By saying that we're dealing with a gioras. Because if it was a kahal situation, you would have an isor lav, the tzuadaka, or in this case our sri sodom, an isor lav which is like an isor kores, and we know that when you have an isor kores, there's no mitzvah of yibum or chalitza. Here we have a sri sodom, yibum and chalitza is mentioned, and we are dealing with a kahal. How can that be? Elo Omar Rabo. Kegoin shenoflo loi ulebasoif niftsa. The Mishnah, specifically Rabbi Kiva, is describing a case where a brother, someone died, leaving a surviving brother who at the time that that the uh, his brother died. If you want to use names, Ruvain and Shimon are brothers. At the time that Ruvain died, Shimon was healthy, and at that point, a zika was formed, a connection to his to Ruvain's widow, to Ruvain's wife uh, slash widow, is formed. A, a a a binding is created between Shimon and his sister-in-law. So the the uh, Gibum connection exists, and then Ulubasov Nitsa, and then he was injured and became a Sris Adam. So that the Chalitza is necessary in order to undo the bond, the Zika that had been formed. So that would be the circumstance of the Mishnah. Omar le Abaye. The Abaye asks Rabba, for lacy isur p'tzua daka p'tzua, let the uh, isur of p'tzua finitchi <coughs> ase diibom. Uh, this is a little ironic because generally speaking we speak uh, in, when we learn Gemara you learn Halacha you see Ase being Dei however here we're introducing the the opposite let the Isur of Ptsua of Ptsua Daka overrule the need for Yibum and Chalitza Milo Tnan do we not have the following precedent for that idea there's a Tanaic source that speaks about, once again, two brothers, Ruvain and Shimon. Uh, Ruvain dies, leaving a widow. However, before Ruvain died, Shimon had married the sister of Ruvain's wife. The marriage between Shimon and that and the and, and that sister of Ruvain's wife 
was a rabbinic level marriage. Was a she was a ktana. She was a minor that was married off by her mother or her brother, not by her father. Father died. The death of Reuven sets up a situation where Shimon is confronted by a real Doraisa Yibum opportunity, mitzvah. However, he can't do Yibum with her because the widow is in effect the sister of Shimon's wife. So, we mentioned that Shimon's marriage to, this, to, to his wife was on a rabbinic level. Rabbinic marriages can be undone through something called mi'un, where the girl, before she reaches adulthood, she declares, I don't want to stay with this man. And she walks out. If that happens, the marriage between Shimon and his wife is really uh, undone retroactively. And Shimon was never considered married to her. And in, in, if, if that happens, Shimon can do ibum with his brother's widow. However... We're going to now see, Rabbi, Rabbi Gamliel says, under those circumstances where Shimon was married to the wife of Ruven's widow, Rabbi Gamliel Oimer, if the Tana wife of Shimon backs out through Miun, fine, the Imlav, and if not, Tamtin, Adshitagdil, Shimon will simply wait until his wife becomes an adult, the Tate say Halazu, the Avoma, will then walk out, Mishuma Chosisha will be exempt on the grounds that she, the widow of Ruvain, is the sister of Shimon's wife. And Shimon, therefore, doesn't do Yibun with his sister. And that's another example of a, an Iser Kores. Alma, what do we see? Osi Iser Achosisha, the negative command behind Achosisha of marrying one's wife's sister, Vidochi. It pushes off the need, it cancels the need for Yibum and Chalitza. Even though, and here we want to emphasize it very importantly, even though at the time of Ruvain's death, a Zika bond was formed. She was fit for Yibum because at the time of Ruvain's death, Shimon's wife was only a rabbinic wife, rabbinically married. And uh, as far as the, on the Torah level of things, she's non-existent. Uh, uh, and therefore, Ruvain could have done Yibom and Chalitza. So that even though at the time at the Shas Nefila there was a bond, we allow, we say that the Isor Achos Isha will kick in and neutralize or cancel the need for Yibo Men Chalitza. Hocha Nami. Let's say the same thing here as well, where uh, uh, Ruvain's death was at a time when his brother Shimon was still healthy, and then he became a Ptsua Daka, Nesi Isor Ptsua, Finitchi. Let there uh, let the, the prohibition of Tzuadaka or Sris Adam come and cancel, push away the need for Yibum and Chalitza. So what, what Rabba is describing and uh, 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 what Rabba is describing is a situation that doesn't require uh, Yibum or Chalitza. So how can he use that as a pshat in our Mishnah? Ela Omar Rav Yosef. We continue with a third approach. Hai Tana, the Tana of our Mishnah regarding the Sris Odom, Hach Tana de Be Rabbi Akiva Heap. We saw in our Mishnah Rabbi Akiva, but there are different schools of thought within Rabbi Akiva. So our Mishnah represents the following school of thought uh, concerning Rabbi Akiva. And we should add also that we're talking about a case where he was first a Tsuadaka and then his brother died. The Omar, our Mishnah, in, 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 in uh, its understanding of Rabbi Kiva, holds, There are different types of Chayve Lavin. Rabbi Kiva mentioned that. 
we mentioned in explaining Rabbi Kiva, presenting Rabbi Kiva, that he views those that are prohibited to the tune of a negative command are like a chiv kores. We know that a chiv kores illicit relationship will produce an illegitimate child called a mamzer. Rabbi Kiva says, well, that a, an illegitimate a, or a, a prohibited relationship that's to the tune of a negative command, a lav also can produce mamzerus, provided it's a negative command of share, of family relations. However, there are negative commands that are not family oriented, not relative oriented. For example, a sris, a soris, who's a tzuadaka, has nothing to do with family relations. It's a negative command in the Torah. Uh, one who who uh, bonds with a a soris, well, would not that would not produce a mamzer. Let us to look together at Rashi. Elo Omar Rav Yosef. We're looking at Rashi's a few lines above at the, where we are in the Gemara, up in uh, the upper part of the, uh, further up in the narrow lines. Elom Rav Yosef, Shinifza v'achakach noflolo. As we explained, first the uh, surviving brother became a Ptsua Daka, and then Ruvain, his brother, died, and she, the widow, falling to him. Udukamris, so Isler, Bekiva Chayve Lavin, Kechayve Krisis, and we said, how can Rabbi Kiva speak about uh, the chalitz uh, yibum under those circumstances? It's like a chayav krisis. Hai tano de masnisin, the tano of our mission that speaks about chalitz yes being done with the tzuadaka, with the soros adam. Hach tano de be Rabbi Kiva hidomer b'chayisiv into eizu mamzer. What creates mamzerus? Call sheir baser shu below yavoi. Any type of relative that is prohibited on the grounds of a negative command. But we emphasize She'er Bosser, it's a relative. Udulok Rabbi Simoy, and not like Rabbi Simoy's approach to Rabbi Akiva, Diyomar, Minakal Hoyoisa Rabbi Akiva, Mamzer, Chutzmeh Monolukoin Godol. Rabbi Simoy's understanding of Rabbi Akiva was much broader, that all kinds of prohibited relations, even non She'er relations, will create Mamzerus, with the exception of an Almonokoin Godol, is an exception to the rule and Rashi cited very uh, in a cursory fashion the, the source for that however all other according to Rabbi Simoy would produce Mamzerus of uh, uh, the fee Rabbi Akiva. However, we're not working with Rabbi Simoy, working with the other school. Now we continue, we go back to the Gemara. So how did Rav Yosef set up the Mishnah? He set up the Mishnah as, as speaking about a case where first he was a Ptsuadaka, then the Yibum fell, then she fell to Yibum, and as such you don't have the issue of uh, the uh, the, the issue raised by the opening question of Rabbi Kiva viewing the Chiyuv Lav as a Chiyuv Koris, because we're not dealing with a, a Lav of She'er. The Gemara asks, Ikri Khan, could you not refer to this situation, the Pasuk that says, Lahokim, Le'ochiv Shem, and what the Gemara is, is uh, asking is on the way we presented Rav Yosef. Rav Yosef presented the situation of his becoming a, first he was a Ptsuadaka and then she fell to Yibum. Here, the Gemara is asking, I'm ask, I'm, I want to raise a problem even from the other extreme, even where he, at the time of, of her Nefilu Yibum, he was actually healthy, the surviving brother was healthy. Still, there should be no mitzvah of yibum because the pasuk says that the mitzvah of yibum is in order to maintain the name of the deceased by pro, through the procreation of the surviving brother that will uh, that will uh, maintain the name of the deceased brother. In other words, it's like you're you're uh, maintaining his his 
his uh, his spirit. Of course, this gets into uh, very esoteric uh, areas, but that's the point of Yibum, where the brother maintains the spirit, the name of his deceased brother. But here, when you're dealing with a a Tzuadak, or you're doing with Sri Sodom, they're, they're, these are people that are incapable of, of doing that. Even if he had been healthy at the time that the brother died, when it comes to the actual Yibum, he can't be Mekayim Shem Ochiv. That's what the Gemara means when it says, Vaha Lav Bar Hochihu. Now, here we're going to look at Rashi, Uparchinon. The Rashi says, Ve'amai Soris Cholets. Why should a Soris be participatory in Chalitza? Fafilu Hoisolo Shasa Kosher. Even if he had been capable at the time of, of his brother's death. He's out of the ballpark. Ikri Khan, Lahakim. We should refer to this. The process is Lahakim, Lahakim, Shame. Omar Rava. In Cain. Here, it's a little tricky. We have to. What was happening in the Gemara is that we. Uh, after Rav Yosef explained that we're dealing with Chayve, uh, Lav, and Grady. Uh, therefore, we are able to understand how Rabbi Kiva could entertain Chalitza because you're not dealing with uh, a type of Chayve Lavin that's like Chayve Krisus. However, but there's still this other problem, a specific problem to a Soros. And that specific problem is, is inability of Lahokim Lahokim Shame. And that problem would affect even a case where he was where the source was healthy at the time of his brother's death so now as I said we're focusing on that specific issue Rava says Omar Rava in Cain if you are going to say that even where someone was healthy at the time of his brother's death and later became a Soros, if you're going to accept that analysis, you'll, you'll never have a situation of a woman actually uh, eligible for Yibum. Because her husband a moment before he dies a moment before a human being dies before a human male dies he became he becomes sterile so that at the point of death you have a widow of a sorus we can look at rashi Omar Rava in Cain Dishas Hakoshe de Mekor Alav Milsahi. If you're going to say that the fact that someone originally was capable of procreation, but 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 later became a Soros, that that's an insignificant consideration. Hayu Ubashas Misa Lo Chazi. Since at the time of death the husband is not capable of procreation that means a, a second before he dies he loses his ability to procreate so you'll never have a woman who's a widow of a healthy person all women are going to be considered the, the widows of Srisen and he was a person that couldn't have had children in the first place because of his, his current Soros status and therefore, she would be excluded from the whole concept of lochim lochim shame. There's, this is only a concept that applies to people who could have had children. But if he dies at a point at, at which he can't pro, uh, procreate, because everyone before the moment of death loses their procreation abilities, so there's never a widow that would be subject to the mitzvah of yibum. Let's just read that line again. Ikri kan lahokim lachiv shein v'halav parhochihu. So Rava says back, if that is what if that is what is of concern to you, well then im kain ein luchoyish to shikshir liyavam shelo nasib bailos rishama shoachas kodim lemisoso. 
the uh, and of course by through Gemara through uh, Rava's uh, ex- exclamation, we see that that cannot be a consideration. And rather, if a uh, person was was capable of procreation and then later became a Soros, so that certainly, if you are going to hold, even if you hold like Rabbi Kiva, but you accept the uh, Hesper that we gave that only from Chayve Lavin of She'er is Mamzerus created, but but other kinds of Chayve Lavin do not create Mamzerus. So then, that uh, 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 all cases of evil can be understood. The Gemara raises a question: Le Rebbe Eliezer Peruka. De Rava Pircha He. In order to appreciate this rather uh, vague line, we look at Rashi. The Rebbe Lezer, we're looking at Rashi on the first line under the Gemara text. The Rebbe Lezer, Piruka de Rava, Pircha He. Gemara Porach. The Gemara is asking, Klomar, Hi, Piruka de Rava. Rava's response to the question that had been raised by the Gemara, Pircha he the Rebbe Eliezer. Now, did, do you remember Rebbe Eliezer? Well, we had him in a diamond up there in the Mishnah. Rava's point would present a problem for Eliezer. We see from Rava that when we analyze cases of Yibum, we have to take into consideration the fact that a person originally was capable of procreation. That's called Shas HaKosher. They were capable of it. And that is enough to qualify someone for Yibum and Chalitza. In other words, the way they are at the point of death, that's of no concern to us. Ah, if that's the case, why then did Rebbe Lezer say that a Soros Adam doesn't do Chalitza? As far as Rebbe Lezer is concerned, the fact that he once was healthy doesn't seem to make a difference. The Srisus that Misa creates, that impending death creates, is something that certainly doesn't have uh, doesn't have a solution doesn't have a remedy <laughs> and nevertheless all women that are that become widows leaving no children do evil <laughs> because their husbands before the moment of death before that they were capable so that if we look at this in a global fashion the only thing that really matters is that a person was once capable of procreation even though they find themselves in a situation now that has no remedy and this is what Rebbe Lezer in the Mishnah spoke about the Sri Sodom is not choice because there's no, he has no refua. well but every man before his time of death becomes a Soros and that's a situation of no refuah and yet we do Yibum all widows that, that, are, fa- are, that are, are left uh, left as widows without their husbands leaving children all of them do Yibum so what is the Tana Rebbe Lezer going to answer to this point the Gemara answers Hossam in the case of that which we described as Sresus at the moment before death isn't really srisus. It's not the the formal case of someone who loses his capacity of reproduction because of some kind of uh, I don't know, uh, because of some kind of injury uh, or health deficiency, but rather kechishusa da aschila be. It's because of an extreme form of weakness that one experiences a moment before death. So it's weakness and not srisus that is described. Hechi domi sris chamo. We said that a sris chamo is someone that has that had never had a shasa kosher. He was never capable. 
Omar Rav Yitzchok Bar Yosef, Omar Rav Yochanan, Kol Shelo, we continue at the top of Dach Pei Omer Aleph, Kol Shelo Ro Sho Achas Bekashruso. A Sris Chamo is someone that was born that way. It was Rashi says Shaloka Mimei Imoi. Mino Yadinon, how can you identify that? Omar Abaye, Kol Hamatil Mayim Veina Oisekipa. Anyone who, when he is matil mayim, that's a, a, a expression meaning he uh, relieves himself of liquid waste, he urinates, and the flow does not form, it uh, doesn't arc, arc over. A kippah is an arc shape. Mimai havoi, how, how does this come to be? How, how is it that a woman produces a child like that? What happened? The afyo ime betiara. It is because the child's mother had baked bread uh, at noontime. Tiara is noontime. Uh, noontime is a, uh, a, 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 a the height of the heat of the day. And at that time she's also heating up the oven. So you've got the heat of the day and the heat of the oven. The Shasya Shichra Marka and she drinks a, a certain type of we'll call a, a certain type of beer. Now there are two explanations in Rashi, two uh, seemingly opposite explanations. Either it's a diluted beer or it's a very strong kind of beer. So that baking uh, a bread at noontime and then drinking this kind of beer will lead to a child that's a saurus. Omar of Yosef, Hainu de Shamano Limid Yomar. I now understood that which my mother had said. Call she mime imoi lokui Fuloyadano Mai Nihu. She had uh, made reference to some to child children that were afflicted from the time of birth. And uh, I didn't know what she was referring to. But now I understand that she's referring to a Sris Chamo, as we explained. Question. Should we not take into consideration that maybe in the interim he actually became healthy? And if that be the case, he would then be someone that had a Shas HaKosher. And if he had a Shas HaKosher, so we saw we saw that that we saw in the Mishnah that having having had a shasa kosher is a factor. We saw this certainly in Rebbe Akiva, for example, in our Mishnah said a sris chamo doesn't do chalitza, doesn't do and doesn't do yibum because he had no shasa kosher. But if in the interim he had a shasa kosher, so he would be subject to yibum and chalitza. So why not take that into consideration? Think of more answers. Kavon. The Trilos of a Sofa Lokui since uh, at his beginning, and as he is now, he is deficient. Lo Chayshina, we don't take into consideration uh, something having happened, some change having happened in the middle. Mosif Rav Mori. Rav Mori raises an objection to this kind of analysis from another source, de- dealing with a different topic, but the idea of coming to conclusions based on the situation at the beginning and the situation at the end thereby precluding changes in the interim we see that's not the way we look at things in in other topics so we have a short quote two line quote from the realm of blemishes on firstborn animals firstborn animal a bachor is a firstborn uh, male animal is uh, of course of a kosher variety is given to a kohen and it's brought in the base hamikdash as a sacrifice. However, a blemished firstborn uh, is not brought as a sacrifice. There are different kinds of blemishes, and here there's going to be a reference to a type of eye uh, blemish, and the uh, the source says. Rabbi Hanino ben Antignus Oimer, Boitkin Oisai Shalosh Pome Besoch Shmonim Yom. And we look at Rashi, Boitkin Oso, Bevachoros Koi, Chavar, it's referring to in the Masechas Bechoros, Chavar Vor, Vahamayim Akvuim, Areze Mum. 
these are different eye ailments, eye situations. They are considered a blemish. V'yezui chavarva akavua. What is chavarva akavua? In order for a blemish to be considered a blemish disqualifying a bechor as a sacrifice, it has to be a permanent, a fixed, permanent type of blemish. What is that? Kol shishal shmoinim yoyim. If it has been present in the animal for 80 days, Rabbi Chanina ben Tignes Omer, Boitino say shalsh palma besol shmoinim yoyim. We have to check him out over those 80 days. He'd have to be checked out at the beginning. That's Barosh Pei, Uba Emsa in the middle. And here we squiggle under on that in the Rashi. This is the key point. A checking has to take place in the middle, Uba Sof Pei, and at the end of 80. Avol Bivdika Tchilu Vesof Losaki. The fact that we may have checked him at the beginning of the 80 day period of time and the end of the 80 days, that wouldn't be sufficient for establishing it to be a blemish. Shema Bein Tayem Ovar. Maybe in the interim, it. It actually healed. It, the chavarver went away. And then it would be a non-permanent type blemish. And we don't say that since it was there at the beginning and the end, it definitely had not passed on or hadn't vanished. So we see that simply coming to a conclusion based on the way something is at the beginning and then using that by the source he was born that way <coughs> and now he is that way that means he is a uh, a source without a shasa kosher well you see from over here we don't say thing, we don't judge things that way the Gemara responds l'chad ever chayshinam when it comes to one limb the eye in this particular case so chayshinam we, we we do suspect or and to raise the possibility of healing in the interim. The kule gufa lo However, something that is a total body affliction, as is the case of a sorus, there we don't say that that is that he to- became totally healthy. He became a non sorus in the interim. Rather, as we said, that if he's born that way and the way he is now, he appears as a sorus. So then he is a Soros without worrying about a Shas HaKosher.